elaborate dynamic study of samarium and gadolinium doped ceria and the interfaces for solid oxide fuel cell applications. The talk will be given by Ayofe Lucid from Trinity College, Ireland. Please. Okay. That was actually a pretty good guess at the name. It's Aoife. So, um, I'm in Professor Watson's group in Trinity College Dublin and I'm currently working on my PhD which is focused on looking at interfaces in electrolytes for solid oxide fuel cells. So today I'm going to tell you about some of my results on molecular dynamics of samarium and gadolinium dope seria. Um, so just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. I'll just give a brief um, motivation on the basis of solid oxide fuel cells. Um, I'll put up some methodology details and then give you some results on bulk conductivity of samarium doped seria only, and then some results on the interfaces of gadolinium and samarium doped seria. So for anybody who read the abstract, I was supposed to be doing strain in surfaces, but I've actually switched to grain boundaries for the time being, so that's what I'm going to be presenting today. Uh, so why solid oxide fuel cells? Um, as David already mentioned, there is a, a call for clean energy, and we're also coming up to an energy crisis. Solid oxide fuel cells have been investigated for a very long time as a possible um, source of clean and efficient energy conversion. They can be up to 80% efficient when using combined heat and power systems, which when you compare it to a standard heat engine with an efficiency of 25% is quite good. Um, they can also, they're very flexible, they can utilise a wide variety of fuels. Um, obviously they will be at their cleanest if we could utilise hydrogen fuel, that would be fantastic. Uh, the problem though, because there's always a problem, is current generation devices use yttrium stabiliser zirconia electrolytes for the most part, and these require very high, op or very high operating temperatures in order for the oxide ion conductivity to occur. Um, there are other uh, components which require high, high temperatures as well, like the cathode, and this high temperature leads to uh, short device lifetimes because of degradation, and it also increases the cost of the devices because you need to have expensive interconnect materials. Um, so, for about 30 years, I think, trivalent rare earth dope seria has been investigated as a potential substitution for yttria stabilised zirconia. Um, we can achieve ionic conductivities comparable to that of why I said uh, with samarium or gadolinium dope seria, but this is done at a temperature of 773 to 1073 Kelvin, which in the solid oxide fuel cell community would be known as the intermediate temperature range. Um, so, in a defect chemistry conference, I don't think there's any need to explain that it's a charge compensation vacancy or charge compensation mechanism. Uh, so for every two samarium three plus or two gadolinium three plus cations, you will get an oxygen vacancy, and these oxygen vacancies are then your charge carriers. Um, so this is how we achieve the oxide ion conductivity in the electrolyte. So the talk is going to be broken into two parts. In the first part, I'm going to talk about the performance of two different interatomic potentials that we've been testing um, to model the ionic conductivity in samarium and gadolinium dope seria. So one is a dipole polarizable ion model, and this uh, takes into account polarizability as, as by induced dipoles from a change in the electric field. And the other is a classical rigid ion model um, that is based on the same form as the dipole polarizable ion model. The reason we wanted to do some testing with this is because the rigid ion model is nine times faster to run calculations with. So in terms of computational um, motivation, it would be nice if we could model these systems accurately with a rigid ion model. Um, and both sets, both interatomic potentials were derived from the same set of ab initio data. Uh, so the other part of the talk is going to be focused on interfaces in solid oxide fuel cells. So in reality, these materials, when they're grown, are polycrystalline. And the microstructure of materials can greatly influence their properties. It can influence properties like thermal expansion coefficients. It can influence the strength of the material. And what we're most interested in is the influence on the ionic conductivity of the material. So for seria-based materials, it's generally accepted that grain boundaries um, and interfaces will decrease the ionic conductivity. But experiment often focuses on the average effect of a grain boundary um, in using impedance spectroscopy and often don't actually fully take out the grain boundary effect from the impedance spectra. Um, but it hasn't been investigated what the different effect of specific boundaries may be. So boundaries can be defined by the surface, the two surfaces that come together to make them. Um, and it could be possible that different grain boundaries could have a different effect on the ionic conductivity and that's what we want to look at. Um, so today I'm just going to talk about one surface and one grain boundary in gadolinium and samarium dope seria. Uh, so just briefly on the methodology, we use PIMAIM, the PIMAIM code. Um, we do five different concentrations of samarium doping in the material. And we look at temperatures that span the intermediate temperature range. So we go from 773 Kelvin up to 1173 Kelvin. So we do go slightly outside the intermediate temperature range, but this is for electrodynamic statistics mainly. 
Um, we do uh, two nanosecond production runs for low temperature and one nanosecond production runs for high temperature to investigate the conductivities. Um, so just for anybody who isn't aware or doesn't look at molecular dynamics calculations, the mean squared displacement can be calculated from the trajectory of the molecular dynamics. And from this mean squared displacement, we can then investigate the oxide ion conductivity. So this is just plotted just to illustrate that. So it's uh, MSD versus time. And this is a trajectory of five nanoseconds for the three different temperatures. So it also shows you the huge temperature effect uh, that you get by running at the higher temperatures. Um, and the slope of this graph is 2ND where n is the dimension of travel and d is your diffusion coefficient. And k here is just a Debye value factor, factor. So from this graph, we can calculate our diffusion coefficients. And from those, then, we can calculate ionic conductivity. So the ionic conductivities are calculated using the Nernstein-Stein equation. And in our case, obviously, the charge carriers are the oxide ions. So here we have two plots. The plot on the left-hand side is ionic conductivity versus dopant concentration for samarium doped seria, and this is for our bulk system. Um, and these are both plots at 973 Kelvin for dip in rigid ion. And it's important to notice the scale here because this is a logarithmic scale. There's actually an order of magnitude difference between our rigid ion and our dipole polarizable conductivities. Uh, so for, for the fact that we're interested in actually trying to accurately model the conductivities, um, it would appear the rigid ion model isn't going to cut it for us. Um, you also see, it's often seen, or it's always seen in an experiment that there is a maximum in the conductivity. So beyond a certain dopant concentration, your conductivity will actually start to drop off no matter what temperature you're at. And this is due to vacancy-vacancy um, interactions for the most part. Um, but you can see for the rigid ion model, though it's slightly hard to see, there's actually no clear maximum in the conductivity. The conductivity at 5 and 10% is virtually the same. And then the conductivity proceeds to drop down after that. Um, in terms of structure, I've just shown an oxygen, oxygen RDF for both models as well. And you can see quite clearly, they're just, there isn't anything significantly different about the structures, but you do see sharper peaks for the rigid iron model, which you would expect from the different dynamics between the two models. Um, so this is just to compare our results to experiment. So I've chosen two experimental values, shown in black and shown in red. And the reason I chose these two is because they show the level of disparity that there is in the literature for conductivity values in dope seria. Um, so there is a lot of disagreement. It can depend massively, I mean, like most things, on how it's grown, uh, how the conductivity is measured. Do they separate the grain boundaries properly? Do they not separate the grain boundaries properly? Um, so you can actually see from this plot, first, there is at least a clear maximum in the dipole polarizable model, which is definitely a good start. It is within the variation of experiment, which is also um, good. And you also see that the rigid ion model is effectively a flat line when compared to experimental values. So again, this was just further confirmation that the rigid ion model for us would not be enough to um, look at ionic conductivities in these materials. Um, you can also calculate the um, oxide ion diffusion activation energies in these materials. I have some extra slides on that if anybody's interested afterwards, but in the interest of time, I won't go into it. Um, so just to talk a little bit then about our surface and interfaces results. So for surf surfaces and interfaces, it is known that oxygen vacancy segregation can occur. And because of this, we run an extra 40 picoseconds of molecular dynamics. Uh, so we do some temperature scaling at a higher temperature than our run will actually be. So we consistently run at 1673 for an extra 40 picoseconds. Um, and this is to allow the vacancies to move, uh, give them a little bit of time at a high temperature to reposition themselves as they want to reposition themselves. Um, for, so the plot here is the number density of the vacancies versus the depth of the slab. So our surface slabs are symmetric slabs. So there's a 111 surface here and a 111 surface here. Um, and it's about 40 angstroms deep. And what this shows in black are the number of vacancies that we had in our initial structure. So our initial structure is just a random distribution of vacancies and dopants. Um, so that's just the random distribution of vacancies and dopants. And in red, you can see where the vacancies have gone to at the end of the run. Um, so this is just a snapshot from the end of the run. And you can very clearly see in both surfaces, the vacancies have segregated towards the surface. Um, in fact, there were no vacancies in the bottom uh, layer of the surface beforehand. So, and just to note as well, for anybody else who does study surfaces, we count a layer as a CEO to the unit here. So we're counting vacancies in this and this here for here. Um, and to look at the diffusion in the 111 surface, um, so this is planar diffusion. Um, so going back to the 2ND that I showed, this would be 4D um, from your MSD. 
and this is just diffusion along the surface and this is a plot of diffusion coefficient versus depth again for the slab and you can very clearly see at the surfaces where we had high vacancy segregation there is a lot of diffusion along the surfaces. Um, you can also see in the subsurface layers, so if I go back, there was a lot, a few, far fewer vacancies and in these subsurface layers we see a depletion in the oxygen diffusion the oxide down diffusion. Um, we saw very similar results for gadolinium dope seria, so I'm not going to have separate sets of results on GDC as the results, not too surprisingly, were quite similar. Uh, for the 111 grain boundary then, uh, so here I'm just showing, it's a, a piece of our boundary, so our boundary is about 80 angstroms deep and we have two grain boundaries in the model, so one at the two ends of the cell and one in the middle. Um, and here, so this is the same as the plot on the surface uh, uh, slab, You've got your depth versus number density of vacancies, and the segregation is actually a lot more significant. Here you can very clearly see that there's been a huge movement of the vacancies towards the grain boundary. Um, and you can see as well severe depletion of the number of vacancies, and because they've all moved towards the boundary in the sub-boundary layers or the layers surrounding the grain boundary. And we, we've theorized that because of these um, these depleted layers, the, the boundary diffusion or the diffusion across the grain boundary will be severely impeded because it will be quite difficult for the vacancies to travel across. Um, so again, just to show the diffusion, you see quite similar behaviour to what we see for the 111 surface. Um, so you've got the bulk conductivity here to compare to. You see a very high, um, or bulk diffusion, sorry, you see a very high diffusion coefficient. Um, along the boundary. So it's very important to note that for these we're looking at just the planar diffusion along the boundary. We haven't measured perpendicular diffusion yet. Um, so we are just looking at planar diffusion, but you see a, about the same increase as you do for the 111 surface um, in the bulk or in the in the ground boundary. And you also see this massive drop in the diffusion coefficient in the layers surrounding the boundary where you have a huge depletion of oxygen vacancies. Uh, so just to conclude, the rigid ion model predicts conductivities which are at least an order of magnitude lower than the dipole polarizable ion model. So for us, this model will not be useful for my, uh, modeling interfaces in oxide ion conducting materials. Um, this is due to the highly polarizable nature of the O2 minus ions. Um, we do see segregation of oxygen vacancies to the surface in the grain boundary, and we see this without dopant segregation happening as well. So it's often postulated by experimentalists that the dopants go or else the vacancies go and one follows the other. But now we've seen that the vacancies will go no matter where the dopants are located because our systems are randomly distributed and we do three configurations of each concentration so that we can measure some statistical variability. Um, enhanced diffusion is seen along the boundary and along the surface. And as I said, we've, we've postulated for now that diffusion across the boundary will be depleted um, due to the depletion of vacancies in the surrounding layers. But we need to look at ways to measure this uh, based on the length of the trajectory that we actually have. And there are further higher order surfaces and grain boundaries currently being studied to elucidate the effect of different interfaces on the ionic conductivity. Uh, so just to thank my supervisor and my group and all of our funding resources and thank you for listening. Thank you. We have time for some questions, please. If it's not the case, then thank you once more. Thank you.